assembly mode. Following the prepared portion of the call, we'll conduct a question and answer session. Instructions will be provided at that time for you to go for questions. The copy of the company's earnings press release and management's discussion and analysis is available on their website and includes cautionary language about forward-looking statements, risks, and uncertainties, which also apply to the discussion during today's conference call. All amounts discussed today on the conference are quoted in Canadian dollars with the exception of U.S. same-store sales, which are quoted in U.S. dollars. I'll turn the call over to Mr. James Burns, Al Canada's Chief Executive Officer. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, appreciate people calling in and uh, your interest in our company. Uh, we announced our third quarter results yesterday, and uh, we are extremely pleased with how things are going and the strategy that we had started a little less than a year ago of changing and transforming our business from a slow-growth uh, company with a failed U.S. strategy to uh, Growth-oriented company in multiple brands, strategically targeted segments of the liquor industry uh, in in Western Canada, hopefully soon to be in Ontario, as well as the cannabis retail sector. As of a few weeks ago, as everyone's aware of, um, our seam store sales growth was achieved uh, with uh, margins better than we had hoped for, given the necessity of uh, strategic pricing in order to, to get that, that growth where we need it. Cannabis launch has been uh, very, very uh, positive for us, better than we expected. Um, and we announced yesterday uh, a, a new strategic partnership with Ace Discount Liquor, which we believe is comes as a direct result of the strategies we've put in place since January. Uh, when we are very confident that with the learnings we've had already in the discount business with our 10 deep to discount liquor uh, banners, that this is a very legitimate and tremendous uh, business, a tremendous growth opportunity. First and foremost in, in sales and, and market share and then in margin. Um, as well, uh, we announced uh, some significant progress in securing locations to build wine and beyond, which is our, our large format brand, which makes for, as a rule, four times the revenue of a liquor depot and five times the EBITDA. And we're very encouraged with that, uh, with three coming in, will be open in 2019, and set sites for six to nine more uh, shortly thereafter, uh, possibly in 2019, more likely in, through, throughout 2020. And this is before Ontario um, comes along with uh, its proposed changes to liquor retailing in that province, uh, which we're anticipating to hear something uh, early mid-2019. And with that, I'm just going to keep my opening uh, remarks very short. I have with me here today our CFO, David Gordy, and the president of our liquor division, Paul Reed, uh, to answer your questions. Over to you, operator. Thank you, sir. So if you have a question, please press star one. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up the handset before pressing star one. You may cancel your question by pressing the pound sign. Please press star one. If you have a question, there will be a brief pause allowing you to register. The first question is from Kyle McPhee from Cormark Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Uh, just hoping we could get some color on the profile of the base stores being vended into the new partnership. You know, stuff, stuff like average sales for store, gross margin, the uh, opex they run with, uh, any kind of would be appreciated, even if it's just qualitative stuff, uh, maybe relative to the average Alcana liquor store. Morning, Kyle. It's David here. The average uh, sales per their stores are roughly 50% to 100% higher than our average. Uh, we'll, we'll disclose more details once we get the definitive agreements done. And their margin profile is in the mid to high teens. In terms of gross margin. Okay. Um, and, and is it fair to say they run their uh, the, the staffing and OPEX level in their storage similar to you guys, or would it be more bare bones? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit tighter than us. They obviously don't have all the overhead that we have, and they've been very entrepreneurial, so they run a little bit tighter than we do. Different philosophy in terms of how they manage and the stars, which we're very impressed with and uh, excited to learn from. To focus on a discount.
discount consumer and in a discount segment, and so the stores represent that as well. But uh, having said that, they are very nice stores. They're very comfortable environments. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that color. And then on a similar note, uh, can you just speak to uh, the type of stores that Alcana will be vending into the partnership? Are these kind of average stores, or, or maybe these are underperforming stores that can benefit from conversion to the discount banner? Uh, sure. Again, I guess, I guess we better not do specific numbers until we get the competitive agreements done, but on a, just a qualitative sort of level. Uh, the stores, I mean, you can do the math, given that uh, we're putting in give or take 50, and Ace has 12, uh, and uh, the math doesn't quite fit. So obviously, uh, if it was, they were all more or less equal in terms of EBITDA contributions. So ours are... Um, tend to be stores in, uh, that have not performed as well and that have either lower sales profiles in their areas or have had intense competition from uh, from, uh, from other uh, newer retailers and they're, they're making, we call them some of these landlord stores. We're sort of paying the rent and paying the employees, but they don't really contribute a lot to the bottom line. These stores were selected very carefully by us in conjunction with uh, Mr. Vander, uh, by, uh, there are none, for the most part, pretty well none, that are really going to be directly uh, competing with other remaining liquor depots, uh, and, and as well as uh, the, the alliance, the new partnership will, will have certain markets that will be theirs in certain smaller communities or, or relatively segmented uh, sections of larger cities, so that will be there to run. So we've, we've been very, very careful about how we picked uh, for a lot of variety of factors. Okay, that's uh, a good color. Thanks for that. And then I just wanted to make sure I understand the, the proposed deal structure here. So this is just the two parties vending in stores to the partnership. There's no capital change in hand. And then uh, the CapEx going forward is just split based on ownership of the partnership. So at this stage, we haven't signed a definitive agreements file, but there will be a change in capital structure. There will be uh, some cash going from us to the ACE ownership, but uh, we'll define that in the coming. To, 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 to make sure there's clean title of all assets coming in to the partnership, uh, to the extent that there was working capital loans and so on, on some of the ACE stores that will have to retire that before the partnership then uh, refinances as a, as a standalone entity. Okay, got it. Uh, and then the last question for me on a separate topic here. On the CapEx you're spending to build out your first 37 cannabis stores in Alberta, looks like you lowered your guidance to 20 to 25 million instead of 35 to 50. So big change there. Just wondering what, what the change is driven by. Well, we got our first five stores opened, and as Jamie mentioned, they were successfully launched. Uh, but over the last number of days, we've been watching and learning how the customers shopping these stores, looking at customer patterns, understanding who the demographic is that is entering those stores today. And we see an opportunity to lower our CapEx investment in our stores going forward with some slight changes and modifications to the store design. So again, also wanting, if, if there's opportunities to lower CapEx, that can return, uh, raise the return on the, that investment. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks, guys. Thank you. The next question is from George Dumay from Scotia Bank. Please go ahead. Yeah, guys, and thanks for taking my questions. Um, I'm George. Hi, congrats on the, um, the, I guess the early day strong performance uh, from the Nova stores. Uh, my understanding there is that we're running margins in the 20s and competitors are kind of closer to the 30s. So just wondering if, if that's a game plan over the next 12 months and maybe can you talk to where you see a uh, margin evolving over time? Uh, I'll answer the last part first, uh, George. Over time, who knows? Uh, it's so early days. There's significant supply issues developing, as everyone's well aware of. Um, but uh, from our Canada's perspective and from our Nova Cannabis brand, we will, uh, we've studied the markets where cannabis has been uh, retailed, uh, recreational cannabis has been legal in the United States including Alaska, where we uh, have our liquor stores. Um, for two and a half years, the cannabis has also been side by side with us. So it's relatively clear where the market for the current products that we're allowed to sell, dried flour essentially, um, and uh, you know, a little bit of oils and capsules, is going to go. Uh, and we just didn't see any reason to take advantage of limited retail outlets or shorter supply in the short term and gouge people. Um, we don't have uh, artificially inflated margins that we've been raising stock, uh, raising price money from, from, from investors to justify pretending to get uh, totally unsustainable margins in any but the long term. So we price really very simply, Kyle. We, 
believe, just priced according to the AGLC that have an online store website, and we are just a little noticeably different than theirs. So they're 1095 or 1045. If uh, if they're um, uh, you know 996, we'll, we'll be 995. It's 990, 945. So it's just just a little bit lower, just within range of that. And we have our black market buster always one strain at 695, which is marketing, but it's also a stake in the ground. And this is about the black market. The other so-called retailers are not competitors. The black market's the competitor, and that's what we're after. And that's the long-term success or failure of this policy initiative is getting the black market out of its products. As as edibles and topicals and other products come online, we do still see margins longer term in this business in the high 20s, low 30s, somewhere in traditional thick retail for this. Quarter. When the other products are coming on site, exactly. But for this, for the stuff that's here now, no. That's right, no, no. And, and to pretend otherwise is silly. Yeah. Misleading, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, the cell phone guys. Um, I, you guys uh, spoke to earlier about the, um, the ACE partnership. And just again on margins, uh, I'm just wondering to what extent do you guys think this, this partnership will improve overall gross margins over time? So the, there's significant upside in a couple perspectives. One is you know, obviously as they look to grow the alliance and build on that business and uh, gain market share, there'll be an opportunity to potentially – improve margins and pricing as they go forward. Two is uh, we plan to provide them access to our private label product, uh, which is something that the A stores haven't been able to have access to this point just because they can't, they don't have the big enough volume to support a program like that. And so we see significant opportunities in the private label business. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And I think we'll, we'll let Paul expand on, you know, what we've learned in the discount business and we can learn a lot from Tank. The,
those marketing tactics, um, once again, uh, not, not only drove footsteps and, and good prompt results, uh, I think they were uh, those, uh, uh, those those tactics for the most part in uh, in, in a small store count um, in in many ways uh, really drove market share and uh, and drove the opportunity to gain market share uh, in the environment. So um, you know, and, and to be quite honest, that that needs to be uh, our go forward plan and uh, and growing market share, uh, growing our, our our comp store basis. Uh, comp store sales is a significant focus for us, and uh, the, the tactics that we've employed, um, once again, have proved that we can see success, and uh, we're going to continue to grow that market share and employ those tactics. It's always tough because there's no publicly available information around the total size of the industry, but for year to date, it appears, and we're pretty confident based on vendor data, that the market has shrunk overall. But while the market is shrinking, we've been gaining significant market share against our competitors through both all of our channels, frankly, one beyond Liquor Depot and then the deep discount liquor. And uh, vendor data shows that some of our major competitors are down uh, high to double digits. 20%, uh, 30%. Yeah. And so uh, we're very confident with the strategy that we've employed. Art, uh, what's your answer, John? Thank you. The following question is from Derek Lee from Canada Orchard Doty. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi guys. Um, just wondering on the um, 50 stores that are, and, and sorry, you may have mentioned this, I, I did hop on a bit late. The 50 stores that are going to be going into the ACE partnership, are those existing locations within um, El Canada's liquor network? That's correct. So then, can you explain to me the, the combination of you're going to have the partnership with ACE, but are you still planning to further develop the deep discount liquor brand, or is that just going to be 10 stores? Well, all of our uh, all of our deep discount stores will be rolled into the new partnership. That'll the new partnership really will operate the discount banner and operate in the discount segment while we focus on the wine and beyond and liquor depot segment of the market. It, you know, it, it gets to be really honestly, we haven't decided in the new partnership. Tank Bander and Don Bobby from uh, who will be moving to the partnership from Alcana uh, have not really decided yet store by store which banners are going to ace and some may remain as deep discount liquor, it's, it's literally store by store. There may be a few that actually stay as liquor depot for a variety of reasons, but they will be under their control. It will be owned by the partnership. Okay, uh, okay, so the, the discount, your guys' sort of discount footprint will be 50 stores, not 50 plus 10. No, it'll be, well, well, the partnership, the alliance will have, the, will be running discount side of the business for for our group. We will we will retain no discount stores in the Alcana group of stores. Exactly. Okay, I got you. Um, and then can we talk about just um, in, in terms of your, your sales increase and appreciate the commentary uh, just now on market share and traffic. Um, is it possible to break out how much of that was came from those discounted sales and how much of it was you know, an increase in the legacy network or an increase in wine and beyond? Yeah, um, we don't talk about it publicly, but obviously if you do the back of the envelope math with the information that we provided in the MDA telling you that the 10 deep discount stores were up 110% over last year and using kind of average store metrics, you can do the back of the envelope math to tell you a fairly significant portion of our increase came from there. Uh, the wine and beyonds were positive this quarter, and then the, the, the liquor depot side of the business, well down, is still growing market share at this stage. But okay. there's no doubt the deep discount stores were a positive contributor to the positive same store sales increase. And the wine and beyonds. And the wine and beyonds, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then just last one for me, and, and uh, I mean, this might be a tricky one, but just, um, you know, given, and we've talked about this before, but given uh, Aurora's ownership um, in Alcana, uh, when are you guys expecting some clarity from the Ontario government as it relates to LP ownership, whether that be you know minority interest of, of LPs and retailers and, and what that's going to look like going forward? Oh, I think they said by the end of the month. So uh, you know it'll be what it'll be, Derek. The uh, they I heard that they're accepting license applications starting December 17th. So presumably they'll want to. Uh, retailers to know the rules for a few weeks before that so people can uh, get their plans in order before they start applying for licenses. Uh, you know, I, we're not overly concerned about this. It'll be what it'll be and we will comply with whatever we don't have any doubt we'll be able to participate in the market uh, as to exactly how or what structures that we will use to do that. 
will depend on the rules that are put in place and we'll comply by the rules. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Thank you. The next question is from John Zambero from CNBC. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Um, you guys touched on it a bit on a previous answer, but uh, going back to the ACE partnership, uh, you've already converted 10 year old stores. It sounds like things are going pretty well. What's the thinking behind adding them as a partner to the mix rather than, say, converting these 50 on your own? Is it, is it just you'd rather you know, direct, redirect your attention to the wine and beyond and the rest of the network and cannabis, or, or is there some other element here? Uh, that's partly it, for sure. Uh, there's just bandwidth, and you can only do so much, but it's probably a little more fundamental than that. We've learned uh, that the discount business, it, it's a different business. It's a different way to think. You run the stores differently. I mean, you know, from our outsiders, shelves of liquor, shelves of liquor, but that's really just uh, at one level, that's true. But how do you approach the business, how you merchandise, how you select inventory, how you how you price, how you go to market and various uh, promotions. It, it's quite a different philosophy. And to try to do them both from the same from the same office, from, you know, the same marketing team, the same operations team, it's, we realized that, well, we did our experiment with just 10, and that was okay to do it on a more comprehensive basis. We really uh, uh, would want to have it stand alone and focus on it business and, and really innovating and driving in, in that business alone. And, uh, you know, we've been very clear for since I got here anyway, and December, January, that our objective is to, um, we are not letting these discounters, uh, the, the newer ones, sit and take our market share away with impunity anymore. We're taking them on head on, and I believe without getting into over details, you can figure it out that the reason we now have a partner as a discounter is that our strategy and positioning of ourselves in the market was very effective, and we have what we believe is the best of them. Uh, exceptionally talented, impressive individual, Mr. Vander, uh, to come and be our partners. And uh, I will also say, without spelling it out, you know, we the name the alliance is chosen for a reason, and alliances tend to have more than two partners. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks. Um, maybe we could pivot to renovations. Uh, I know you gave it a number for the capital required, but you did you disclose the total number of renovations you expect uh, in 2019 or in 2020? So we didn't, we haven't given any guidance on 2019, 2020. Uh, as we sort of mentioned in the MDNA, we're saving our gunpowder for all of these initiatives. We really want to see how Ontario shakes out in the next month on the cannabis side, and we believe in the coming months on the liquor side. Obviously, there will be some renovations that we do in the Alberta and BC market and the Alaska market where it's necessary or where we see opportunity. But for the most part, we're going to hold back our capital until we know what Ontario looks like. Okay, understood. On, on the cannabis front, uh, this might have been in the MDNA, so I apologize if I missed it, but uh, when do you expect you'll have your 37 up and running? And I know there's still you know a ton up in the air, but is it more likely to be uh, by the end of Q4, or by the end of Q2 next year? What, what can you say there? Um, the real answer is we are not sure. We have many sites ready, and we are being a little careful how we're building out at the moment because a number of our sites, and mostly they were the better ones, were initially rejected at the municipal level for, for, for proximity to parks and things that uh, we challenged and have taken to the SDAB, which is the equivalent out here of the LMB in Ontario, and we've appealed three uh, so far and won all three, uh, adding a thousand. Um, and uh, so we're switching which sites are which in terms of some of the ones we might have done, like a B site, let's call it now. We've got some A sites. We're getting these appeals uh, successfully uh, processed. And, and that with the supply constraints and the, the forecast of supply being spotty at best, it's a bit of a euphemism for the next few months, um, we'll most likely continue to build our stores. Uh, to the customers and to our 
two would be still that's what we were always aiming at, and that's still a pretty good target. A little earlier, a little later, you know, maybe. It, it depends on all sorts of stuff, not just supply. And it's really DPs, and these appeals are changing how we're thinking of which ones we're going to do, that sort of stuff. Right, okay, fair enough. Um, uh, I guess last one from me. David, you, you mentioned it earlier, you've been watching uh, cannabis consumers and how they behave. What, what can you share with us in terms of lessons you're learning, or maybe a better way to phrase that is what surprised you most so far for the for the launch? Uh, I don't know if there's anything that surprised us. Maybe Jamie has something that he can point to, but for the most part, the, the current consumer base in the early days, the ones that wanted to wait in line were existing users. Uh, they wanted to participate in the legal market, and they came out in droves, as you probably saw in the media. Uh, but what we are seeing today is a transitioning of that consumer base. A lot of new consumers, a lot of people that may have used it a number of years ago or haven't used it at all are starting to come into our stores. Uh, given that there's no supply, there's no lineups, and they're coming in to get educated and to learn about the product. And so it's going to be interesting as it takes shape as we get new products coming in the fall. Uh, I think those new users are going to be much more receptive to using edibles and topicals. But what we, what we found in the existing user base is they definitely want an in-out experience, and so we're designing our stores to make sure that we have express lanes for those individuals that know what they want and, and they want it fast versus the others that want a sales cycle that might be 20 to 30 minutes long. So we're incorporating that in our designs going forward. Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly what I would, I would agree with all of that. We, uh, I don't know if it's a surprise, but the, you know, the fact that so many, I mean, the target the black market, and these customers were black market customers on October 16th, and now they're all coming to the legal market, as well as a surprising number of medical cannabis customers, uh, consumers who are coming to the legal stores just because it's so much easier to get their the products they need uh, medically and have them have medical prescriptions for, but they'd rather just buy it straight off the shelf and not have to go through some of the all the hoops that uh, that are required to, to continue to get medical uh, marijuana prescriptions. So um, both of those are very encouraging for the long run. You know, new people again, just smoking is not all that popular, and a lot of people are waiting till. Uh, the rest of the products that are you know, widely retailed and, and make up bulk of the market now in, in the American states where it's illegal uh, by quite a substantial margin uh, are waiting till those come on board. People aren't going to wait in line two to three hours to come and ask a few questions and go home. Now that the lineups have abated uh, larger because there's not much to, to buy in the stores, uh, give and take on and off, we are getting uh, curious the people and people who are coming in and just having a chat and exploring and trying to understand the product. So that and that will evolve more as time goes on. Yeah, and I could just to emphasize something that Jamie said. I don't know that it was surprising, but it was a great confirmation. There is a high degree of willingness for people that are in the black market today to come to the legal market and yeah. pay yeah. more than what the black market is charging today. And so that was very encouraging for us and I think bolsters our resolve to enter this space in a big way. Yeah. Okay, great. I uh, appreciate the color. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Robert Gibson from PI Financial. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, last quarter, you mentioned that you could put a wine and beyond into a smaller footprint. Just wondering what these new four stores may not may be as far as size. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's Paul uh, speaking. Um, yeah, I think that the, the wine and beyond footprint is an interesting footprint. We've talked about market share, and we've talked about driving traffic, and I don't see, to be quite honest, uh, you know, market share and, and driving traffic solely in the uh, in the discount area. Wine and beyond is a significant opportunity. Um, you know, I've, I've been in this industry uh, from a traditional retail environment for the last five, six months, and I truly see an opportunity as a disruptor uh, in this uh, in this business, and, and the, the liquor retail business is ripe for a disruptor. Uh, I see over and over again the same kind of liquor stores in a convenience model in a traditional small footprint uh, with racks of liquid and stacks of boxes, and Wine and Beyond gives us an opportunity to provide a new experiential retail concept, uh, a retail concept that uh, 
truly provides knowledge, uh, experiences unique to the business, uh, and gives customers an, an outlet to uh, uh, to try new products and uh, and be able to leverage those new products in uh, in the different occasions that they find themselves in in their life. Um, I think that on the whole, retail uh, has seen disruptors over the last 10 years that have really positioned them in the marketplace as market leaders by creating new retail concepts uh, and building out that experiential uh, retail end. And, uh, and we see wine and beyond as that opportunity. Can it be done in uh, 10,000 feet? Uh, we've seen success in conversions out of our liquor depot stores uh, on our Southgate uh, location to convert it uh, to a wine and beyond and, and seeing results that uh, truly have uh, blown away my expectations. Uh, I think the footprint fits better uh, into a larger, uh, larger footprint and gives us an opportunity to create those unique experiences in this environment that traditional liquor retailing just can't compete with, to be quite honest. Uh, so we do see our wine and beyond stores growing uh, and uh, and growing at that 20,000 uh, foot uh, footprint. That said, uh, we're certainly not going to pass up opportunities of high performing liquor depots where the branding uh, might uh, represent well uh, to uh, to look to build out uh, in that uh, smaller footprint size. The two sites, uh, Bob, that we specifically called out that we've done deals for in Lethbridge and St. Albert, they're really new markets for us. And so. And we see those markets as one-store markets, Lethbridge and St. Albert. So we're going to put our best foot forward. We found some great real estate. So sometimes the real estate in the area dictates the size of the store. And in those cases, they're both about 20,000 square feet. Uh, but as we look to some of the other cities, as we look at bolstering our presence in Calgary, we do see opportunities to fill in with 12,000-foot stores as well. Okay. And just quickly switching to cannabis, I was just wondering if we could get any color on on the real estate in Ontario and, and what, what it's like to try to grab leases. Oh, yeah. well, I can say right off the bat, we are not trying to grab leases. We'll wait for the rules. And uh, uh, I note with some amusement that the same people that grab leases and built stores out here and are now sitting on a whole bunch of fully built out dead are doing it again in Ontario, and they're more than welcome to. Uh, we have discussions with all our landlords, the ones we've been dealing with for decades, and we've got many sites, 91 trade areas identified. We will then see what, uh, how the rules work, and uh, again, you know, there's no supplies, so there's no particular panic to open on April the 1st to empty shelves. If that's the case, we'll get our sites uh, signed when the time comes that it makes commercial sense to sign them. Uh, and what we're, we don't see, uh, Ontario is a very different real estate market than, than Alberta. We're dominated by two big cities with, with, with very concentrated uh, retail nodes, frankly, places that are zoned. Ontario is very different because the cities were built differently and zoned differently. And with the Ontario government having legislated uh, out the municipalities of Ontario, taken away any ability they have to to impose their own restrictions and radiuses, which is what happened here in Alberta. Um, and I'm sure the Ontario government was very cognizant of the issues in Alberta and took a very, very well-advised, in our opinion, step to make sure it didn't happen in Ontario, especially given that it's a little behind in terms of timing in order to be able to get their uh, their legal retail system into the marketplace quickly and, and take the black market on. Uh, uh, we're just not concerned whatsoever about uh, that there's lots of real estate in Ontario. It's, it's very different than here. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Sure. Thank you. And this concludes today's question and answer period. I'll turn it back over to Mr. James Burns. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, moderator. I'm just going to turn it over to our president, of Liquor Paul Reed, to uh, just provide a summation and our, our vision of our liquor business. Paul. Uh, oh. Thanks, Jamie. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's been a relatively short period of time. It feels like I've been here almost a year uh, or, or longer, but uh, um, at the same time, uh, I can't uh, highlight the opportunities I see in the uh, in the business and uh, um, where we see that business going. Um, you know, the discount.
discount, as I said before, the discount banner isn't the only banner we see as opportunity to drive market share. Um, Wine and Beyond presents a significant opportunity to not only drive market share, but bring to uh, bring to customers a very new way and different way of retailing alcoholic beverages. Uh, and I think that uh, in this day and age and the general trend that uh, retail is on, uh, customers will uh, will uh, like that concept. Uh, and as we've seen over the last four to five months, and some of the tests that we've done uh, have proven to vote with their wallets and uh, have uh, visited those wine and beyond stores. Uh, and we've been able to drive significant sales, significant traffic, and increase margin uh, out of those boxes. Um, providing new retail experiences isn't just about bricks and mortar. It's also about uh, providing opportunities like delivery in markets where we see uh, significant opportunity. Vancouver markets, uh, we just launched uh, yesterday our delivery uh, uh, service. We've been delivering products uh, in markets uh, in Alberta, Edmonton, and Calgary uh, for a period of time. We've been uh, successful in that environment, and I'm confident with some enhanced marketing support and focus and uh, infrastructure, uh, that business and our online business, our e-com business, as we will build out, uh, will continue to uh, to drive awareness to our brands and, uh, and gain significant market share in this environment. Um, there's a lot of tools that, that, that we can employ to drive margin, uh, and as I said earlier, uh, I'm pretty confident uh, and very comfortable in that area in driving margin uh, through many different, different initiatives. Um, in the current economy that we see ourselves in, uh, where Alberta is uh, in, a, in a depressed economy, where uh, we've seen quarter over quarter decreases, we posted a positive comp result last quarter, uh, and it really highlights the initiatives that, uh, that we are working on are resonating with our customers. We have continued to take market share and see that our competitors out there are losing ground in the same way that we're gaining ground. Um, building out um, significant retail opportunities on the line and beyond, enhancing that brand, uh, cementing those relationships with our customers are significant opportunities as, uh, as we go forward. Um, in the end, the, you know, retail is, uh, is retail and uh, you know, we're all competing for the same share of wallets. Uh, and I think the way in which we uh, go to market and uh, and relate to our consumers, uh, touch base with our consumers, uh, will take on uh, certainly a new and uh, interesting way uh, and successful way of driving business into our stores. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. The conference call has now ended. Please just